Well, welcome back live the Kennedy Space Center, the place, perhaps a place where history will be made in just a short while, a little more than a half hour. That clock reads 20 minutes and holding, T minus 20 minutes and holding to be specific. We are in the middle of a 10 minute planned hold that is part of NASA's routine here as they tidy up business, make sure everybody is set to go on to the next level, which will begin at 1.30 p.m. Eastern time. They will count the clock down to nine minutes and engage in another 10 minute hold. Once again, all this is about safety. All this is about making sure everybody's doing their job right. All this is about making sure we have a safe flight today. Nothing on the horizon whatsoever, which would indicate the shuttle will not launch on time at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The crowd, Bill, and uh, the Kennedy Space Center has been closed down because it's just jammed with traffic. Uh, there are so many cars there, they can't go anywhere, and that's where the people are gonna watch the liftoff. Whether they wanted to or not, they're stuck, and it's actually not a bad viewing spot. It's pretty close. Uh, some of the traffic has been backed up for five miles, we've been told, but overall, the Sheriff's Department says that everything has been going well. There have been no major problems, no major injuries, and uh, everything is going well, and uh, everyone is now just waiting for the launch. Miles, back to Don't you. Do, can't do you yet. All right, thank you very much, Mark Potter. Enjoying the scene from the group on the causeway and the beaches. The clock has started up once again, and we will continue counting down from 19 minutes and 24 seconds on down to nine minutes, and then we'll have another 10-minute hold. Once again, all part of the routine here. Let's move along to Ohio. You know, Ohio, for some reason, is the home to more astronauts than any other state. The Buckeye State has 23 astronauts, present and former. Jeff Flock is in New Concord, where uh, John Glenn was born and has spent most of his life. Jeff? That's right, Miles. We still haven't figured out exactly why there are more astronauts here from Ohio, but we know it's true. We're at Muskingum College. It's a small college out here in uh, New Concord, uh, Ohio. And if you go down to the floor, we're up here with a couple of special guests who have spent some special times with John Glenn over the years. But first, I want to take you down to the floor and show you the big screen televisions that have been set up. It's reminiscent of 36 years ago. It was the uh, college gymnasium back then, too, where all the press and all of the townsfolk gathered to watch their hero uh, reach for the stars. And they are here again. The old gymnasium where that took place is actually now named for John Glenn. And I'm with one man who was the best man at his wedding and another man who played football with him here at Muskingum. And uh, Lloyd White, I guess I have to ask you, what's going through your mind and what's different about this one than the one 36 years ago? Well, I think, as John said, the technology is so much improved now. I guess I'm not as nervous <laughs> as I was 36 years ago. He's got a pretty but, good chance of coming back this time. Oh, I think so, yeah. I think so. I'm not too worried about that part of it. Yeah. Uh, We've got a picture, by the way, of that, uh, of that wedding day. You said uh, you almost don't remember that. That was quite a while ago. Yeah, well, yeah. And I didn't know there was any pictures ever taken of it. But I do have a clipping that told who was there so yeah. Uh, yeah that was a great day he was in service at that time yeah. and came back from service and right. in his uniform and and uh, obviously he's the best man there was another student another guy who had been in school there I can't I, but I don't know who it was I want to move to uh, Harold Kayser now who uh, played football here at Muskingum with him Harold did you ever have any indication when you were playing football together back then uh, where John would wind up no, no indication of where he'd wind up, but we knew he had had some real basic skills. He was a good player. He played center on the team, and he hit hard. He he had certain goals that he wanted to accomplish. He was committed to accomplish his goals. Uh, he was a good guy, good uh, good sportsman. You know, we got a camera outside. It's uh, uh, out at the old gym, which is back then not named for him, but it is now. And they're gonna they're gonna. Uh, uh, plan a uh, time capsule out there to kind of mark this momentous occasion. Now, uh, uh, Lloyd, about John going up now at his age, some people have criticized it and said, oh, it's just a reward for past service and all that sort of thing. Well, uh, he's serious about this. Of course, he's been chairman of the aging committee for the Senate, you know. Makes sense to you. Yeah, and he's worked a long time okay. on this. Lloyd, Harold, I appreciate it very much. Thank you so much. We're going to leave you with a shot of uh, this uh, place, I guess it explains Miles and Walter as well as anything can why John Glenn is who he is. It's out in this small town, out in this country, this beautiful country of Ohio. It's where he came from, and he'll never be farther away from New Concord than he will be today. But in some ways, I guess he takes a little bit of it with him. That's the latest from here, folks. Back to you.
All right, Jeff Flocky in a beautiful new Concord, Ohio. Look at those fall colors there. A beautiful yeah. day there, just as it is a beautiful day here. We have a couple of special guests joining Walter and me. First of all, sitting immediately to my right, Buzz Aldrin, the second man to walk on the moon, who has been sitting here watching the countdown go down. And from Sacramento... I think I recognize him anyway. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and Can't from, miss seeing you, Walter. <laughs> from Sacramento, California, Chuck Yeager, the man who first broke the sound barrier in an aircraft. Uh, Chuck, first of all, uh, what are you thinking about this flight? Good idea? Yeah, it's a pretty good deal. You know, uh, NASA sorely needs some publicity, and they couldn't have picked a better guy than John Glenn, who did such a tremendous job back in 1962. And, and uh, I'm watching with a great deal of anticipation. And I uh, talking to Walter Cronkite, man, I get the feeling this is an old man's show, with, uh, with the exception of the, of the young six that are hauling John up into space and talking to Walter, who's been around for a long time, and myself. Last time I saw Walter, we were on the ramp at uh, Edwards looking at a bunch of old airplanes, if you remember, Walter. Never forget that, Chuck. And as a matter of fact, uh, I, I wonder, are you a little more comfortable today with this form of rocketry? Uh, you and I, uh, after my talking to you, I became convinced that we should have been working on returnable aircraft from the very beginning rather than go for the disposable booster. Yeah, basically, uh, like you got Buzz there beside you, he uh, sort of served as a commandant of the Aerospace Research Pilot School. The Air Force was very much in space with the mo mold, manned orbital laboratory, and the X-20 Dinosaur, which was a reusable space vehicle, but they sort of changed things in 1966 and, and uh, made space for peaceful purposes, and uh, we sort of backed out of the, the space program, and, and uh, consequently, NASA has done a very good job, uh, w with the exception. I, I just sort of get the feeling that it would have been better to put a young astronaut in that seat that John is sitting in so that we could use him for the next 15 years. Yeah, it, well, when you took X-1 up there and, uh, and, uh, and uh, broke the sound barrier, we thought maybe you'd go right on up to the stars. Well, that, <laughs> I wasn't qualified to be a NASA astronaut since I only had a high school education, but it was fun flying airplanes. You bet. Well, you, you did a great job of it, too, Chuck. Thank you very much, Walter. You Ch bet. Chuck, you. Uh, let me ask you one question. I, I know in the early days of the program, uh, t test pilots such as yourself often had disparaging remarks for astronauts. They felt the old spam in the can uh, analogy applied. I assume you think differently these days. Is that true? No. Basically, the shuttle is, a, is an airplane, and the guys who fly it uh, fly it like an airplane and land it like an airplane. Originally, uh, with the stuff that Buzz uh, flew in the original seven astronauts, it, they had very little control over where the vehicle landed because they had a very low LOD. And consequently, uh, I, I was an airplane guy and uh, didn't hold an awful lot of interest in, in the capsule return. The shuttle's a different vehicle uh, because it flies like an airplane. Well, Buzz, I, I, go I, ahead. Uh, I'm afraid if we had uh, stuck with airplanes, the Russians might have beat us to the moon. I think we needed capsules. Uh, we needed the simplest way to get up and then provide the maneuverability on orbit and as much control of the landing site as possible. Uh, it certainly uh, is a viable way to put things into orbit with uh, airplanes, as we're seeing with the shuttle. I'm very much in favor of booster rockets, first stage rockets, coming back and landing like an airplane, but, but being launched vertically. Yeah, well, I, I wonder. Go ahead, Chuck. Yeah, basically, Buzz, if you recall, the X-20 was a, a very similar vehicle to the, to the shuttle itself, and, uh, but we'll never know, so it's all speculation. Well, I guess I suppose in a perfect world, you could have had both programs going simultaneously, but uh, money was uh, scarce as it always per is. Perfect and even richer world. <laughs> exactly. Well, when an airplane has to carry all the fuel along with it, uh, it gets to be quite large. When it's just being boosted, as the shuttle is just being boosted, and the X-20 was just going to be boosted, uh, you have to do something to contain all that rocket fuel that's going to get it going up there. And you'd like to recover that part, and that means a recoverable booster. Yeah. Yeah. Chuck, I want to ask you, you said at the outset that you feel that NASA needs the publicity, and this is a good uh, publicity, well, stunt perhaps. Uh, uh, NASA continues to insist this is about science. Do you believe them? Yeah, well, I don't believe it's as important as, as you would be led to believe, uh, basically because uh, one seven-day orbit by one old guy, uh, like we all are old, uh, in my opinion, won't give you very valid data, and that's the way I feel about it. Would you like to go if you had the opportunity? 
I, no, it'd be a waste of money. I'd rather see the young guys, of which there's more than 100 sitting down in Houston, eager to get into space, and we could use them for the next 15 years as, as a active astronauts. And that's just the way I feel about it. Well, you know, Chuck, they say that uh, one man of database doesn't make. Uh, in the case of John Glenn, uh, one man's experience at the age of 77 up there won't do it. Uh, you're a young kid of 75 right now. Why don't, uh, why don't we have a succession of flights and all of us uh, at this advanced age will go one by one and we'll get a good database for well, it. Walter, if I remember a few years ago, you were sort of slated to go up in the shuttle and uh, I agree, you know, quantity makes a good, good quality. <laughs> I think we're building a crew here today. Cronkite, Buffett, Jaeger, and Aldrin. Yeah. No, I, 